afternoon and thanks for joining us. I'm Judy Simpson. Today we're going to get an up-close look at who and what is living in Vermont. Scientists at the Vermont Center for Eco Studies in Norwich are trying to document every living thing in Vermont and they need your help. Rebecca Gollin tells us about the Vermont Atlas of Life. I'm going to watch this for a second. It's already uploaded and it just says on the database, I saw something and it's the picture of it. Let's see if Ken McFarland has here. seen this plant before but the name is not coming to mind. To get some help identifying it, McFarland posted a couple of pictures to a database online called iNaturalist. There, several hundred amateur and professional naturalists from around the state and beyond can offer their opinions. He doesn't have to wait very long. Just a few seconds later, and he has an answer. So, one of the guys already answered me, Kyle Jones, is on the site. He says, it's poison parsnip. You were right. It's poison parsnip. Which McFarland and his colleague Chris Rimmer are conservation biologists with the Vermont Center for Eco Studies, or VCE. They're demonstrating the crowdsourcing capabilities that support one of their biggest projects. The goal of the Vermont House of Life is to map out every living thing in Vermont and where it is. Wait, everything? Everything from fungus and lichens to, you know, birds flying over your head. I suppose if you're really into it, we could get into soil bacteria. That's why it's called the Vermont Atlas of, of Life. They really do mean everything. Oh, there's an honeybee. Yeah. VCE has produced several comprehensive studies of different species in Vermont. Most recently, a revised edition of a breeding bird atlas, as well as a complete survey of the state's butterflies. Hundreds of volunteers work with the group to collect data and information on a wide variety of species. There's a tremendous diversity of people that are involved in our projects. Of course, many of them are interested naturalists, um, not just birders, because we're working on amphibians, we're working on bumblebees, we've worked on butterflies. So anybody with an interest in any aspect of natural history and wildlife is, is a candidate. And um, yeah, we've got people in their 80s and we've got people in their teens that are out there collecting data for us. The Atlas of Life won't be live online for a few more months. For now, contributors post their observations and photos to one of the associated databases, which will feed their information into the Atlas. Although VCE does have some projects that require special training, anyone who wants to can play a part. You could take a picture of something while you're hiking of a tree, a leaf of a tree. Say, you know, I think this is some kind of oak, but I'm not sure. And you could post it on there and, and you could just say, Here's a tree I saw, here's where I saw it, here's what it looks like because the photo's on there. Somebody help me out, what is this tree? And there's so many naturalists on there now that someone will see it and they'll say, oh, that's actually a white oak. That's pretty uncommon in that part of Vermont. Do you think it was planted or is it natural? And there'll be a little conversational ensue and some others might jump in on the conversation about that species. And so not only are you providing a record of that tree in that place at that time, but you're also able to learn um, a little bit more about that species, a little bit more how to identify them, just from everyone else joining in and helping you. The observations add up. Vermont eBird, where bird watchers can contribute their sightings, has over a million records, with more being added every day. These folks are feeding us information that we could never collect on our own on a large landscape scale. And at the same time, they're learning a great deal, they're becoming engaged in, in science and conservation on their own, they're becoming more informed stewards, they're becoming ambassadors for wildlife conservation in their own communities. So it's really a, a tremendous um, two-way street. I have about 2,500 on the iNaturalist observations and uh, about two-thirds of those are actually Vermont. Roy Pilcher is one of those volunteers. Raised in Africa, Pilcher came to Vermont in the mid-60s, already an avid birder. And there's nothing like putting you in the moment when you're watching birds. I mean, the rest of the world really doesn't exist. When you've got your binocular on a warbler and you're trying to identify it or you're trying to uh, watch its behavior or see where it's nesting, re really the rest of the world doesn't exist. It's really, you, you connect yourself to something that's living and it's completely involving and uh, just takes you over completely. When Pilcher came to Vermont, 
he had to transfer his knowledge of African birds to the American birds he was now observing. What I did right away, I kept field notebooks, and luckily I had pretty good records. So when all this information became digitized with eBird, eButterfly, and iNaturalist, I had a lot of information which I was able to transfer. Another big thing you can do is you can explore data. So you can actually go on here and map out where birds are in Vermont and beyond. So maybe you want to know, hey, where are the state, where's the state bird been seen lately? Hermit thrush. You can go on here, type in hermit thrush, and get an instant up-to-date map of where all the hermit thrush sightings have been. When the Vermont Atlas of Life is fully up and running, it will be an online clearinghouse of information for students, educators, naturalists, and others, as well as a place to share their own observations. In addition, as people around the state contribute their real-time findings, and longtime naturalists like Pilcher add their data, the scientists at the VCE will gain a clearer idea of what changes are taking place in Vermont. As time marches on, are things changing? Are um, red oak trees moving further north? Are white pines moving and sugar maples moving higher in elevation? Um, are birds changing the date they arrive? Are butterflies changing their flight times? I mean, this phenology, this timing of things is really important, and that's only by observing it over and over and over every year. So even putting in every single you know, monarch butterfly you see in there helps solve that phenology, that timing issue. Is it changing? So it, it never is going to end. That's good news for a pilcher. I enjoy collecting data. I enjoy entering it, uh, both for the actual experience of the time, but the fact that that data is going to be used you know, down the centuries. Literally anybody can contribute a piece to help us put the puzzle together of biodiversity conservation in Vermont. And that's the beautiful thing about this. The Vermont Atlas of Life might never be finished, but the information it will provide will soon be helping to protect the state and everything that lives here. In White River Junction, I'm Rebecca Gollin with Across the Fence. Thanks, Rebecca. Our next segment takes us to the oldest park in Major League Baseball to meet one of the game's senior groundskeepers. For more than 30 years, David Meller has been caring for Fenway Park, and under his guidance, Fenway is considered one of the most beautiful ballparks in the country. But Meller's story is much more than his high-profile job at the Red Sox. While the park is now covered in snow, across the fence visited Meller in Fenway a few years ago. He spoke with Leonard Perry about caring for one of the most famous fields in sports, and he also talked about a devastating injury that took away his opportunity to play the game of baseball. So David, what's it like to come to work at this great ballpark, one of America's greatest every day? It's a dream. You know, I get goosebumps every day I walk out here. It's an honor to follow in Joe Mooney's footsteps and to work for such a wonderful organization. You know, ownership and, and support throughout the, the club is fantastic. So it must uh, vary uh, with when, when the Sox are here versus when they're away, uh, your hours, or you just come in every day and just work late and as needed? Well, and you know, we, we do whatever it takes. You know, whatever, it, the weather dictates a lot of our job, too. So one of the first things uh, I look at in the morning is weather. And one of the last things I look at before I go to sleep is weather. And we plan our days around weather, around extra events. And uh, as far as when the team's in town, too. And you know, we're very fortunate to um, have a great staff. And, and we also have a weather service we worked with that uh, helps us be able to plan our days well, too. I don't know if you uh, do like some growers I work with, and uh, they check like six different forecasts and take the average. Because <laughs> so they never trust any one over the other. <laughs> I don't go to that extreme. But, but yeah, you have a yeah, have more reliable source there. Certainly watch the weather very closely. Yeah, I'm, imagine, you know, and that'll dictate if you're mowing or not, I assume, and uh, just what practice you're doing. And Absolutely. And so you know, forth. there's different disease pressures and different areas we want to work on versus others. Okay. Uh, well, how did you come about having such a dream job as this? Well, you know, I, I dreamed of making it to the majors as a baseball player and was hit by a car and couldn't play anymore. And my family said to not dwell on what I couldn't do, but to focus on what I could. And uh, I walked on crutches for two and a half years, walked with a cane for 10 months, missed three years of college. And my family said I was actually lucky. I had an opportunity to really find what, what, what my passion is. 
and I decided, you know, I loved mowing grass, I love science, and I love baseball and being outside. So I thought, what, what job is that? And that's a groundskeeper in the major leagues. And for me, my job is the next best thing to play in. You know, I interned for the Milwaukee Brewers, California Angels, and the San Francisco Giants. I went to Ohio State, got a degree in landscape horticulture, and then also agronomy. And for me, it's, it's literally the next best thing to play in. I know I see a lot of, uh, you mentioned these are in some interns out here you have working during the season. You intern, I assume you'd recommend that for a student with a similar idea is that an internships are important. An internship gives you a real, real, real world opportunity to learn. And you know, what works in the textbook doesn't always work out on, on the field because of weather or making something safe and playable for the game. Then you come back and use the textbook and, and that background to fix things. But sometimes you have to fix and make it playable right now. And by having the interns here, they bring a, a passion with them. And I'm fortunate to have a great staff to go along with the interns. We mentioned uh, it's just so fun coming to work every day. What are, uh, if you had to pick out one or two things you find most enjoyable but about looking forward to when you come here? Gosh, just, just being at Fenway Park. You know, I emulated, you know, Fred Lynn, Jim Rice, you know, Louis Tiant when I was playing wiffle ball and baseball growing up. Um, the place I walk on, in and out of the stands the most, uh, my father and brothers used to sit there when they were much younger and my dad and my brother died. And so for me, it's very special for me to walk by those seats every day, multiple times. And just to, to soak in the ambiance of Fenway is, is very special. Well, that's great. Well, it must be something that, uh, that you know, is a problem that here or there issues or challenges. So it, over the years you found uh, were here, whether it's with the field, it, um, things you've had to change, could you uh, share any of that? Well, I, I think in any problem, it, there's really an opportunity. You know, I think adversity makes us stronger and creates opportunities for us to learn from. You know, I certainly hope to learn from my mistakes and it's something that, you know, we can all become better at. So any challenge that you're faced with, I think is really an opportunity in disguise. And, you know, it's an opportunity to thrive and, and build on your success and, and learn from mistakes. So, you know, I don't look at something like, oh my gosh, you know, we have a major problem here. I think it's an opportunity and uh, I'm fortunate to have a great staff and great support from upstairs to fix whatever challenge there is. I know you've said in the past when you came here the drainage wasn't uh, exactly right and uh, you had to fix that, so I guess you looked at that like here's an opportunity to really improve this, make this even a better field. The last major renovation was done in 1934 and it was wow. a soil-based field that uh, had a big crown to it. And so certainly the technology now, you know, not only do we have better irrigation and drainage and uh, uh, cultivars and everything like that, but we can have a safer field that drains down through. So ownership invested in a new field in 2004 and, and it's really helped in many different ways. That's great. Now you've um, got such a handle on the professional aspects uh, and you've actually written a book on the home lawns too. What would be a couple of key tips you'd recommend for uh, home owners for their own lawns? And problems you've seen or opportunities I should say. Well I think one they want to make sure they're cutting at the proper height. You know many people mow too short and they don't mow often enough. So in New England, you should be mowing between two and a half and three and a half inches high. You know, the hotter it is, the higher you want to mow it. So the grass blades shade the soil down below. You want to make sure you're being smart with water. Now, obviously, don't water if there's a water ban, but you want to water um, at the right time of day. You know, during the day, uh, the wind's going to affect it more. It's going to evaporate more. And if too many people water when they get home from work after a hot day, and the best time to water is between 2 a.m. and 6 a.m. So that water is available to the plant come the next day when it gets hot. They've, it's not going to evaporate as much. The winds aren't usually as strong at night. And so they can get timers for their hose. They can hook up their satellite, or excuse me, they can hook up their uh, irrigation system through a satellite system so that takes into consideration the weather forecast wow. and really helps uh, program your system so you're not wasting water. Well, this is just great to uh, learn a bit about this and your background and uh, just appreciate so much uh, a few minutes of your time and the Red Sox management for uh, this chance to visit with you here today and uh, appreciate learning a, bit, a little bit about the park and uh, some home lawn tips too that hopefully some of our viewers can take home, get your books and read those too. I'm glad you guys came down and look forward to seeing you again. And just in case you're wondering, the 2018 season opener in Fenway is Thursday, April 5th. 
That's our program for today. Thanks for joining us. I'm Judy Simpson. I'll see you again next time on Across the Fence. Thank you.